Good morning. My name is Kelly McCarter and I'm coming to you from North Carolina State University in Raleigh, North Carolina. This is the uh, webinar entitled Planning in the Face of Change, an Urban Forestry Webinar Series. Today's topic in the series is Urban Wood Resource. We're starting our webinar today uh, with a few slides that will help you participate fully in the webinar and we hope it's a good experience for you. The first thing we want to make sure you understand is how to use Blackboard Collaborate in the context of our webinar today. Today's webinar does not have camera or video and uh, we are not um, turning on microphones for participants, only the speakers. So we want to make sure that you use the chat feature that you see listed in item number three on your screen right now. And if you would like to test that, please feel free to say hello, use one of the emoticons, um, and be comfortable with that. We'll be taking all of our questions for the speakers today using only the chat window. And we're holding all of the questions to the end. But don't worry, all of the chats are being recorded. And we'll go right back to the beginning of the session, if need be, to pick up any of those questions you put in the chat window. We will also be doing a poll today, which you see listed in item number two on the orientation. And this will give you the opportunity to respond to our question about you. And we'll uh, take about 60 seconds uh, to let you answer the poll question when that slide comes up on the screen. As far as audio is concerned, item number three, well, I certainly hope everyone is hearing my voice right now. And if you are having any problems with that, this system comes equipped with a setup feature that is a wizard that will walk you through making sure your microphone and your headset, hopefully your uh, speakers, are all working well. If you are not hearing us, uh, please do click on that little microphone icon and run through the setup on your own. And that way you can be sure that everything's working uh, from this point forward. OK. Now we're going to do the poll that I mentioned a moment ago. We'd like very much to know a little bit about who's watching this program today. So I'm going to um, launch the poll that you see on your screen right now. And uh, we hope to find out uh, a little bit more about you. I see some people are already uh, clicking in their responses to where they're located in the United States today. These locations that you see are basically set up according to time zones. And so um, I'll give uh, another 45 seconds or so, or so, so that we've got a full minute for everyone to respond to that. And then I'll publish those responses, and you can see where everyone is from. Currently, by the way, there are 46 people uh, participating in this webinar today. Some people are giving their responses through the chat window, and that's great. Thank you, Janet Beal. I hope you have a happy Thursday, too. OK, that's probably enough time for uh, most people to get in their responses to the poll. And so now, uh, by uh, publishing the responses, which you'll see on the screen, we'll be closing the poll. At this time, you should be able to see that um, most of the people participating today are coming from the Eastern Time Zone. I'm not exactly sure. Uh, where the other would be from, but that might be international for all I know. And we do have um, some people west of us participating as well, so thank you very much. Moving on, I want to introduce to you the moderator for today's program. 
Eric Mukey is with the North Carolina Forest Service and he is an urban forestry specialist in the Urban and Community Forestry Program at that agency located, uh, the agency is located in downtown Raleigh and uh, Eric is coming to us from Morgantown, West, uh, Morgantown, South Carolina, North Carolina. I'm so sorry. Can you tell I'm nervous? No way. Anyway. I'm going to turn this over to Eric and he will introduce you to our key speaker for today and then later we'll uh, wrap up and uh, thank you very much for your attention and Eric, uh, turning it over to you. Thank you Kelly. Um, I hope that everyone can hear me. Um, I am out of the Morganton Forestry Center here in Morganton, North Carolina. A uh, small little community nestled in the foothills region. Uh, my main region that I work is what we refer to as Region 3 which is the Western Mountains and Foothills area. A little background on urban wood in North Carolina and the North Carolina Forest Service. We started working with this back in 2010 with an idea from Bill Hasher out of the Biltmore Estate, the birthplace of forestry in the United States, on utilizing some of the waste wood that was coming off the estate and turning it into marketable items. So in 2010, we got a U.S. Forest Service redesign grant to begin work on this. In 2011, I attended the CAL FIRE workshop where they were attempting the same process. So in October of 2011, we actually held a workshop at the Biltmore Estate where we were utilizing uh, local woods, urban woods, Biltmore Estate wood, uh, basically for artisans. We have a lot of craftspeople in that area and they had a lot of interest in it. We expanded in 2012 and held another workshop in Durham that was uh, based on fuels and biofuels and usage like that. <clears throat> in 2013, we joined with the North Carolina Urban Forest Council to put out a website page in 2000, later in 2013, we also held a meeting down in the Charlotte area with the Charlotte Arborist Association. Then in July of 2013, I attended a workshop in Maryland where they were utilizing urban wood. And finally, in late 2013, we began our first North Carolina urban wood group workshop where we had a real good mix. So it was fuels, it was biochars, it was artisan products, it was value added products, that kind of thing. Currently we have about 30 individuals at the core of what we call the North Carolina urban wood group. They're from municipalities, commercial arborists, portable sawmill operators, kiln operators. We have the benefits of university staff, extension people, and FIOP. Uh, we also have the North Carolina Forest Service, of course. We work with utilities and the Urban Forest Council. The Urban Forest Council helps support us by doing some workshops across the state. We have six every year in different locations. We call them Carolina Canopy Workshops. And when possible, we do bring the message of urban wood utilization to those workshops. We also use their website to house a urban wood group page with information on what we're doing there. Our biggest news is that we are currently working with Virginia Tech. Uh, we polled all of the certified arborists in the southern chapter in North Carolina on their knowledge about urban wood and what they're doing. And we also worked with municipalities that were over 12,000 people in population looking to better understand current practices and perceptions so we can develop outreach materials and tools to improve the utilization of urban wood. And with that, part of that project is that we have a newsletter that we are putting out. It will probably be uh, every other month newsletter at this time and unless you know we really start get, getting people to contribute and put information out there. Anyone who would like to receive the Urban Wood Group newsletter here that we have in North Carolina, feel free to send me an email. My email address is right there, eric.muke, M-U-E-C-K-E, at N-C-A-G-R dot gov. I appreciate you all attending, and I'd like to thank Kelly and Addie and our other moderators, and I would like to now turn it over to Harry. Harry Watt is 
Uh, he's a wood product specialist working for the North Carolina State University Wood Products Extension, who works in the forest and wood products industry from sawmills through value-added products like cabinets, furniture, and millwork. He focuses on helping clients grow sales and profitability through supporting grants. Here he is working with the North Carolina Urban Forestry Council to promote the full value utilization of materials removed from urban forests. Harry has worked in many woodworking sectors, including furniture, hardwood, plywood, caskets, and dimension products. Harry, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much. Harry, um, we need you to t uh, turn on your talk button. I don't hear you at the moment. OK, thank you. This is Harry Watt, and uh, it is exciting to uh, participate in the Urban Forestry Council webinars and other events. Uh, very much I'm dedicated to making full utilization of our wood resource. And as our population grows in the US and across the world, we need to make use of our urban forest to relieve pressure on our commercial forest. So with that, I would like to uh, move forward here talking about a little bit about who we are at NC State. Uh, we do work the full uh, counties, the 100 counties in North Carolina. We do also work with outside North Carolina with the US Forest Service with some cooperative uh, events. I do have multiple websites, but if you can go to the one at the bottom, uh, my NC Wood site at the bottom there of, of this slide, you can see that uh, a lot of the projects that we do work on, uh, I do fully support with a lot of PDF downloads and other information from our workshops and other events. I do work on grant uh, projects, and the grants support the industry in various directions. And currently, I've got three grants I'm working on in Western North Carolina and uh, beyond. The Golden Leaf Foundation is our tobacco settlement money, and we're working to assist wood shops sell to retail stores in North, Western North Carolina. We're also working with the North Carolina Forest Service and the US Forest Service Region 8 to get more wood products made locally into schools and local governments. Uh, with the Wood Education Resource Center of Princeton, West Virginia, we're working to host a national firewood workshop, and we're doing that in uh, May uh, of this year up in Albany, New York. And then we have a small sawmill workshop in Princeton, West Virginia at the Wood Education Center, and that's going to be uh, on June 11th. And I do f have that information on my Project It Wood uh, website, the NC Wood. When we talk about utilizing urban wood, what we uh, have to realize is that we're only using something like 25% of it for any useful purpose. And we're talking about the woody materials that would be logs and limbs and, and so forth that come out of the urban forest. And there's a lot of reasons why that number is as low as it is. Uh, certainly, we have such a scattered uh, resource. It's scattered all over the cities and a little bit at a time is harvested. There's great variations in what's being produced in terms of species, the size, the quality. So in a lot of ways it's hard to collect and that's why that number is low. There is a lot of interest in uh, this growing for the utilizing the urban wood and we've get, been getting lots of assistance from our federal forestry people, our state forestry people, our cities are more and more setting up urban arborist departments and working with utilities. Uh, we also have some nonprofit uh, organizations that's becoming a part. So in the future, we can really expect that we're going to see a much better uh, utilization of our urban forest. If you, if you try to put some numbers to it, and I've, I've looked several times, and, and one place I found that it was estimated there's 22 million tons of urban wood generated annually. 
And if you look at that 25% utilization, if we just took it all and ground it up as industrial wood fuel at $20 a ton, we'd be looking at $440 million of value. Uh, so it's kind of interesting that we uh, could greatly increase that utilization if we were to put it into more value valuable products. So we, tr we have a hierarchy of what we can do with their wood. And the default or lowest use is probably things like uh, industrial fuel. So as we go up, we can make it a lot more. And we can also get our utilization factor up. Uh, we do realize that a lot of times the wood waste, uh, the wood that comes out of the urban forest, is storm related and it's just a huge amount of coming in at one time that overwhelms whatever uh, businesses we have set up and, and cities and so forth to use what comes out of a steady stream. But we all know that our, our trees in the, in the urban areas do die and we need to have a plan to be able to utilize these and, and get value out of it. But when we look at our urban use, one of the questions we have to think about is how do we get uh, the best use out of each piece of wood that comes through. And one thing we might want to think about is, is what does the uh, commercial lumber industry do? Well, they generate through the mill, they convert the logs into boards. And eventually, there's always a place in the sawmill where there's a grader looking at the board determine what the grade is the board, and the sales department tries to get that board, regardless of what grade it is, high or low, to the customer that's going to pay the most for it. So the value really depends on how well we manufacture that item, that log, that branch, or whatever, into a product. And if you look at the hierarchy of uses going from low to high or top to bottom, Typically, you'll have some kind of artistic wood that, uh, with a great artist, the wood can be uh, quite valuable. But as you go down, you have the thick slabs or the two, three, and four inch thick pieces that we typically cut with a long chainsaw and some kind of a sawmill rig. Uh, those can be quite valuable. And some of those, even if they're just as short as eight feet long, can be worth over $1,000. And then we start getting into our lumber. And we look at high-grade boards being valuable. Uh, Construction-wise, we make logs, timber frame homes, uh, beams into various construction projects. Those have value. Then we get into our low-grade lumber, which can be rustic and made into value-added products like cabinets, furniture, and millwork. But they also get made in industrial products like pallets. Uh, there's a huge market and volume of wood that goes uh, into the to the, uh, the pallet industry. Also, we have the firewood industry that tends to split wood into burning not only indoor stoves that everybody thinks about, but we can also think about uh, how much uh, wood can go into mulch products, which is a ground wood product. One of the things that's really exciting about looking at the urban wood is how well it can support many local businesses. And what's interesting is because of the, this, we have small volume of wood that's widely scattered, we can also have widely scattered small businesses. Uh, there are lots of physical obstacles to overcome. Uh, in trying to set these businesses up. But these businesses can be focused on many sub-areas, such as the harvesting, the transportation, the processing, and the retailing. Uh, these businesses can just pick up one segment of this and be quite successful and have either one employee or, or several employees. Um, and working with the small businesses, we can also have cooperation between various cities that are fairly close together. And we all know as we look across the US and the metro areas, a lot of times we have cities that are close together. And a small business can be focused in one part or one segment of the processing and work in multiple cities. The good thing is you look at the uh, the photos on this slide is most of the businesses, if you're only going to focus on one sector, it's not a huge dollar cost to get into these businesses, whether you're an arborist, uh, a hauler, or a processor. Um, 
each person here can set up a small business and, and earn a livable wage and generate uh, a profit by doing uh, one part of the of the uh, the processing of the wood from a standing tree into a, a value added product. It is kind of interesting uh, what the value is of a particular item depends on many, many things. Uh, it depends on who you are, where you are, how well you market, uh, what is needed. And these are just example prices that I put in here. Uh, you can go anywhere in the country and find higher prices than this. You can find lower prices than this. But this is just giving some example. The, the boiler fuel, for you, fuel, for example, can be a mix of many things, including bark and solid wood and, and all kinds of things. Uh, and let's say that's $25 a green ton. And then as you start moving up into things like pulp chips and mulch, uh, fire grade logs, low grade logs, high grade logs, and slabs, uh, the value really depends on can you find a buyer. Uh, anytime you, you, you market wood products, your business savvy has a lot to do with what these things are worth. It's not a fixed market everywhere originally set. It, it depends on your abilities, how well you produce a product, and, and how, how well you can market it. The interesting thing about the slab market is one, some people are not familiar with this, but if you go into some furniture stores and some uh, wood uh, products galleries for artist galleries, you'll see a lot of times thick tables that are two, three, four inches thick. And these can be quite expensive. And being on the artistic level, the uh, the value, it is a small market. There's, there's not a, a, high, a large number of these being bought and sold, but the ones that are being bought and sold uh, can bang uh, lots of value. As you start looking at what is the value of lumber, and we happen to be in a in a market that probably over the next few years you'll see the value of lumber increasing. There's interest all over the world in North American hardwoods, and not many of our uh, much of our lumber and our logs are being exported all around the world. Uh, industrial pallets and cross ties, which are really uh, very much in demand these days. Uh, for example, you may look at that being a four hundred dollar a thousand or forty cents a board foot product, and then, as you move up into the lower grade of better species, the upper grade of better species, uh, thick slabs, uh, these prices certainly move around and if you want to see what prices are, there are marketing services that can uh, can look at what things are worth and there is as you look at the variations, are certainly high-grade species, low-grade species. Um, there's a, certainly a difference between the softwoods and pine, the major uh, products. It's all over the board. And the interesting thing is our urban forests certainly have great diversity, and our markets are widely scattered and uh, fragmented also. So. Every situation that you, you can look at from a business point of view, if you look at what the value is, well, the value depends on what somebody is willing to pay for it. It is important when we start looking at urban wood, if we're going to get the value out of it, we really need to think about we have a standing tree, how are we going to cut the tree down, how are we going to prepare it. We do have the possibility of losing value through things like poor choice of how we harvest the tree, if we let the wood stain, we can we typically start out with great potential, and then if we don't follow through properly, we can lose the value of what the wood is there. Uh, so what we certainly want to do is to plan the harvest to get the most value out of the wood, regardless whether we're cutting logs that go into lumber or logs that go into firewood or whether we're going into uh, branches and, and wood uh, stems and so forth that get ground into chips and mulch. So if we're going to be successful in recovering this value, we have to uh, plan these things in advance. If we look at what's happening in the, in the urban forest, we 
forestry, we do have a great interest in using the, pol the smaller portable mills for cutting this wood. Certainly in the urban forest, we have lots of problems with metal, with concrete, with all kinds of things being in the trees. And we really want to be cutting these logs up with blades that are fairly inexpensive. So if we hit something, we're not going to have a great loss. And also, we also look after safety. The great thing with the portable sawmills is we typically have blades that are made out of solid metal. They don't have inserted teeth and things that can fly out. So if we hit something that's in the log that's going to damage the blade, it's, it's not typically going to be a safety hazard for the operator. And if we have a, a blade that's a $20 blade, and we're, we're sawing uh, logs that we can sell for much more than that. Uh, hopefully, we don't take such an impact and loss in the, uh, in, with hitting things. The portable sawmills are affordable. Uh, there's all kinds of uh, manufacturers of the sawmill. Uh, the, the mills cut good lumber, and they are uh, can create lumber that can be used in the value-added products, such as cabinets, furniture, and millwork. Um, one of the things that's been happening over the last 10 years is we've gotten some great success stories in getting this urban wood into the retail lumber market. And in the uh, area of southeast Michigan, for example, Many of the small sawmillers have made uh, network connections with the Habitat for Humanity stores. And in these stores, uh, various small businesses rent space, put their products in the stores, and both the uh, Habitat stores are making money and the uh, wood processors who do uh, the value-added products as well as lumber and slabs are able to get their products out to the public. It's been a very much a win-win situation for the wood processors to get in their wood into the stores and to the general public. It's interesting, as you look into the urban areas, uh, nowhere in the country is there a surplus of manufacturers in the cities uh, making these wood products. So. There's kind of, in some ways, an unlimited need for dried wood and millwork products for new construction or remodeling projects. Um, it is possible with good marketing and good uh, processing methods to sell everything you make if you, if you work hard and have a good business and get it out to the public. The public is interested in our products, whether it's flooring or cabinets or millwork or artistic wood. Um, I do believe that it is possible to be very successful making these wood products. And as you look at the urban woods, uh, the urban woods have, in some ways, great character. Often, you're looking at trees that are that have large size. There's great diversity of species. Um, the urban areas have trees that uh, not only come are U.S. native trees; they also come from all around the world, and in the hands of skilled craftsmen and uh, building professionals, these woods add great value. And there's just no limit to the things that can be done with this wood that the public would be interested in buying. So we do have lots of opportunity for the public uh, to get these woods. And a lot of these woods have great stories. So it's possible to not only sell a product that has style and function, it also has the story with it. And I will mention that yesterday I was down at a small sawmill operation that got some trees from Meredith College. And one of the logs, there was two logs out of this tree. And uh, the small log was 12 feet long and 72 inches in diameter. And the large tree was 12 feet long and 75 inches in diameter. And the wood uh, sawmill processed it into slabs that were three inches thick. And this is going to be some great products that's going to be made most likely into tables. But it's certainly a wood product with a story. So you sell the functionality, you sell the style, but you also sell the story. One of the interesting things that we can do with our urban wood is in construction. And we do have in construction the opportunity to produce things that, with round wood, as well as rectangular wood like posts and beams and rafters and so forth. And uh, the photographs here show a timber frame home, 
a log home style and a wooden deck. And the wooden deck is actually one that was made out of some recycled utility poles. Uh, so we can take, we can reclaim wood, we can cut the urban forest uh, through these uh, processing centers and create an opportunity for a lot of small businesses to be successful. One of the big industries in the urban areas is firewood. And firewood has a special place in the, uh, in the urban forestry utilization because we're able to uh, take short pieces of wood and make firewood. We can use, uh, typically, if you, if you have a firewood processor, which is a machine that can, has a chainsaw or a saw to cut to length and then a hydraulic ram to split the wood, um, it certainly is helpful to have wood that's, say, 8 or 10 inches and larger in diameter. So you're looking at logs that don't necessarily saw well into lumber. But we can use this wood in indoor stoves. We can use them in outdoor stoves. We can use this wood into uh, uh, outdoor fireplaces. In fact, in, in Huntersville, North Carolina, this week I visited a firewood processor that does a very good job of converting logs from the urban environment into firewood. And he is excellent at selling pine firewood yellow pine. He takes the yellow pine that comes in from the Charlotte metro region, splits it into firewood, and markets it as outdoor firewood for fire pits. And he has developed such a good base, a uh, customer base for his pine firewood that he sells out every year. He does not have a tr any trouble at all selling pine split firewood. So. When you look at firewood in the urban environment, we can support large-scale processors that may be selling in, on the national or regional market, but we could also be selling on the local market to individuals. Um, when we look at, at chips and mulch, we're looking at products that can be used by homeowners and landscapers and the compost industry. Typically, when you get into ch uh, chips and mulch, you're looking at grinders and chippers. And certainly, as we uh, process the wood, especially the upper parts of our tree and branches and things, the chippers and grinders make a lot of sense. Uh, the chips can also have a value uh, in the fuel industry. Um, so we have an energy market for our, our chips, our grindable wood. So again, we're not trying to convert big, large stems and wood that can be sawn so much into chips and mulch as we are the smaller pieces, the, the crooked pieces, and a lot of the odds and ends pieces of wood. When we, when we do this planning for our urban wood, we, we have to think about the whole the whole process. How do we get the trees down? How do we move them from one place? Which of the primary processing operations we want to go to? Is it a sawmill? Is it a firewood operation? Is it a grinding? Is it a chipping? And then we have to think what happens after this. We've got a flow of wood. This wood is going to be moving every week. What's going to happen to it? So we end up having to distribute it back to the customer base, whether it goes back to the consumer, industrial markets, into some distribution uh, region. And then we have to figure out just what, uh, what somebody is going to pay and can we make a profit off of it. One of the interesting things I think is helpful for everybody is if you are looking at logs that can be sawn into lumbers, have some estimate of what the uh, volume in a log is. And if you look at a typical log scale on the international quarter inch scale, uh, on the left column I've got the log length, on the right I've got the uh, expected board, uh, the expected diameter you need to get 100 feet out of a log. So if you have a, an 8 foot log, you need 17 and a half inch diameter small end log to get 100 feet on the quarter inch uh, international scale. So if you remember the numbers 18, 16, 14, 13, and 12 and match that up to the log length from 8 foot to 16 foot, that's the log diameter and size you need to get 100 board feet. So when you look at a log, you can roughly estimate how many board feet in it. And then you can look at, well, what 
kind of log is it? Is it low grade log, high grade logs? Is it a premium species or a minor species? And then if you have some guess of what the green value of that product is, you can have some idea of what a log is worth. So a lot of times we're looking at logs and we as you look at this hierarchy, who can use this log the best and how do we make money off of this log? So you're looking at grade and you're also looking at volume. When we plant our harvest, we have to really think about, is there any metal in this tree? Because the one thing we don't want to do is to send a tree that's got metal to somebody that's going to have a problem with it. And the thing about sawing a log into lumber, if there's any metal, metal in that tree, you will absolutely hit it with a saw blade or a planer knife. So we really have to be conscious and responsible as we're taking down these trees to get them to the right place. And if there's any metal in the log, we want to share that information to um, somebody that's going to be using this log later off. And certainly when we start sorting our logs, we want to start doing our sorts where we're taking the logs down. And if we have multiple people that can use our logs, then we want to get the right species, the right size, the right grade to the, to the right people. Because we're trying to max, we, we've got to move the wood first of all. And the second thing is we have to get the most value out of it. So we want to send the logs to those that can get the best out of it and pay us the most for it. And we certainly want to have enough people in our group of users to be able to use all these logs promptly. We really don't want these things sitting around at the customer site or on our yard either. So as we look at from the stand and tree, how do we cut this tree down and bucket into the right length and the right uh, the right uh, the right methods here, and it's kind of interesting as we've gotten into the portable sawmills and we've been adding chainsaws to our sawmills now to cut these thick slabs. Suddenly, these forks that we typically saw as being problems become the big assets. People want to be able to see this fork made into a table, and these people that have modified sawmills to put chains for slabbing can often do uh, cuts that are 60 inches long, 70 inches long. So we can do a tremendous, not only a large log that's a large diameter, we can go up past the fork and be able to incorporate that in something like a table. So if you can develop a customer base that can, can take this log and not only saw lumber, but saw past the fork, it may be those trees that we saw as being problems in low value certainly become high value trees. Certainly straight trees that can make long boards are valuable. And sometimes in certain mills, they can take a short log as down as four feet short. Um, some of these mills, like the wood misers, for example, they have clamping uh, mechanisms and, and so forth, so we can cut a small short length. So it's, again, you have to develop a good relationship with the processor and find out what they want and be able to look at the standing tree and figure out what can we do to get this wood into somebody that can make full use out of it. As we go to move the trees, one of the issues has to be is, is if you're a, a, an arborist and you're taking a tree down, you don't want to spend a lot of time hauling your logs all over town to dispose of them. They need to go someplace. And that's why it's important in the urban forestry uh, movement here that we have a, a, a large number of processors that are widely scattered. So the arborists who want to spend their time taking trees down don't spend their time driving all over town to dispose of them. And certainly a flatbed truck that has the log standards can carry logs, and typically a box dump truck carries the brush but can also carry the logs. And these can be private businesses. Um, certainly an arborist has to make arrangements for this by having their own equipment or being able to contract with another business to do it. But the, any person that wants to create a business and all they have is a truck can certainly haul these logs around from the arborists who are taking down the trees to the processors that do something with them. 
It is interesting, and if you notice the truck on the right, it has a grapple that can pick the logs, it can pick the brush and, and drop in. Uh, those can certainly be uh, on a flatbed truck also, and that is a good business for somebody to develop in an urban area is being able to move logs from place to place. One of the interesting things for small businesses is, is how do you get started. And one thing you want to do is just to see who are the players that are already out there. Who are the arborists? Who are the lot clearers? Where are the firewood operators? Who's doing chips? Who's doing mulch? What sawmills are out there? Uh, it's critical in the urban environment to have some people that are doing the lumber drying. Uh, while it's great to create greenwood products, kill dried products are easily sold and add great value to any green wood. And also to know well, who out there is in the wholesale business and who is in the retail business. Because what we have is we have such variety with what's going on in the forest that there's not a single place that this wood goes. It's going to go to multiple places. And as you look for business opportunities, look who's missing in the chain, who's not there, because we need everybody to make this work. So if you're looking at trying to start a business, uh, the missing links not only are who in town, who in the metro area is not there, but who in each part of the metro area. If you look at a city like Atlanta, for example, we, there's not just one place you need a sawmill. You need 20 places for a sawmill. You need 20 places for grinding. You need all this, these businesses widely scattered and available to make the urban forestry utilization factor improve. And if we want to get started, we really want to think about cooperating with the urban forestry staff. Uh, we have been adding uh, urban foresters into the, to the, to the mix of uh, the staffs of has become very important. It's important to remove hazard trees. It's important to manage uh, the public. Um, but the urban forestry staff can be the ones that organizes meetings and brings together the arborists, the general public, the existing processors, prospective processors, wholesalers, retailers. Uh, the urban staff can also provide information from tree inventories and make the best guesses of what annual removals are. Because anybody that's trying to set up a business is going to have to have some idea to generate some, some reasonable numbers to put into business plans. And as we look at the business opportunities, let's look at, uh, if we can, estimate how many tons, how many cords, how many board feet, what's the quality of materials. Uh, let's kind of get some idea of what the profit margins can be for the various segments. Uh, what we can look at is how to grow the existing businesses and what else can we do to help new businesses get started uh, where we have the missing links. And again, we look at geography because we need in the urban areas to have a widely dispersed processing centers. And always we look at what's missing. Uh, if we're using our wood and we're not getting the products, what can we do about it? Uh, as we look at the various products we can make, we can certainly understand there's, there's markets for slabs, there's market for firewood, there's market for glued up boards, mulch. It's because we have such a varied resource, we have a great opportunity to convert this wood that's going to come out of the urban forest into products uh, that not only help us use things, but also help us uh, improve our, our lives. So in conclusion, I'd just like to bring uh, a few points, and one is that we have a lot of woody materials that's in the urban forest. The quality can be quite good. We can convert these into products that the public needs and can be sold, and we can support lots and lots of businesses, both new businesses as well as existing business. And everybody can contribute to replanting the forest, so this is an annual uh, place that we can uh, process this wood into things that we can use. Eric, would you like to step in? We have any questions? Um, by my count, one of the questions that was out there was about um, EAB issues and transportation. Um, 
and I'll just jump in with that a little bit, that when we get exotic invasives that move in, that often falls under some type of quarantine. So really, you know, especially with urban wood, portable mills, and, and having that local ability to deal with that, that would, you know, it kind of fits in there better than thinking that we have to transport these logs to other areas. So that would actually reduce chances for spreading EAB around. I agree uh, exactly with that. Is you know, the more local we do, the less problems we're going to have with the bases. And there was also, uh, do you have any special recommendations for using urban wood waste as an industrial commercial boiler fuel? Uh, no, other than to find out from the, the boiler people what material they need. Uh, some of the boilers are set up to burn, burn green material and some to, are set up to uh, burn dry. So it's just a matter of trying to match one uh, with the other. There's, there's more boilers out there burning wood than, than most people realize. Uh, so it's a matter of, of chasing down not only in wood process and industrial like paper and wood products, but also many greenhouses today are burning wood uh, in order to heat their greenhouses. There's a question then, how about uh, small scale local pellet stove fuel production? Well, well, pellets is an interesting um, interest area. Most of the pellet mills that I know something about tend to be on the large scale because to make pellets, it takes a lot of capital equipment. It takes a lot of energy. So the, the pellet industry is, tends to be a large scale industry instead of small. Uh, but there's also a briquetting industry that some people aren't familiar about. But briquetting, uh, tends to make a large, uh, they can be various sizes, but they tend to be much larger than pellets, and they use dry wood. So as you, as you look at pellets, they tend to either have to dry green wood to make them, or they have to take dry wood to make them. We have a question on chip value seems very low in your study. What dynamic markets for commercial products uh, how can we, as managers, capture these fiber units and make a profit? Well, the uh, the value depends on what somebody wants to buy, and you know we're talking here sort of the U.S. urban forestry. So the value of this chippable wood and burnable wood and, and so forth is all over the board, um, and certainly depends on the shortages, the time of year, and, and so forth. Um, the value is not necessarily anything that I'm, I'm just trying to show that there's, you have to go into your local area to see what, what these values are. I mean, I'm not setting prices for chip wood, uh, but you can go into some areas where it's very valuable and some areas where uh, it's low. So the value uh, depends on the buyer. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a question from Frank on uh, kilns are very expensive. How can one dry urban lumber? He doesn't know of any local private kilns in the Atlanta area. From, from my experience, just to jump in, we have a, a number of small uh, kiln operators in the Asheville area due to the fact that the artisans up there really want that wood. Uh, most of them are just converted uh, railroad boxes, Connex boxes. And we do have some that are working on solar kilns. Our Haywood Community College is, is that, is that the one that puts on the, uh, the kiln workshops every year, Harry? Do you know that? Uh, we used to do it there. Their kiln, uh, we're, we're no longer going there. But uh, what I'll jump in and say is a lot of people have gone to, uh, to on startups into dehumidify, dehumidified kilns by taking, like, the uh, either an insulated trailer or a storage uh, uh, export uh, oh, container. Uh, some people, just to get started, do that, and then once they're successful, they may put in a, a different kind of dry kill. But there's, there's more kills out there than you realize, and, and one resource for finding them is the WoodWeb website. 
uh, it lists local people by uh, state who do saw, small sawmills and lumber drying. Let's see, we had a question then. What about local ordinances? Our city prohibits selling wood from public lands. How do you introduce this change? Ah, yeah, the, the good old, we, we can't sell it and we can't give it away because we're, we're a municipality and, uh, you know, that's, that's showing favoritism of some sort. Um, we have communities, I know that Durham is currently working, uh, Durham, North Carolina is currently working on being able to get rid of their waste wood by utilization processes. Uh, it's, it's sticky. Um, I've worked in communities where we did. We just gave it away for free. We had uh, log yards for people to go out and, and cut up wood for home heat. That was very common. But again, that, that's a case-by-case -case municipal basis. Are there any other questions out there? Just kind of scrolling through. Uh, Kelly, thank you for getting that that uh, hardwoodweb.com up there. Eric, uh, I would encourage anybody who's on the uh, webinar today, if you happen to know any uh, resources like, for example, hardwoodweb.com or any um, companies that you're willing to share, please feel free to drop that right there into the chat window so other people can see. And for those who arrived a little late, we do have uh, over 75 people on the webinar today who uh, stretch as far as the mountain states in the United States. So. Um, Anything that you want to share that might actually be good nationwide or network would be really great. So thank you for sit, for sharing that information if you can. And Eric, I'm just going to uh, turn back over to you uh, to answer any more questions or make more comments. Okay, I am back on, I think. Uh, I'm, just, I'm just actually typing in my email address uh, in the chat box. Are there any other questions? Uh, municipal restrictions, checking the salvage processes cities have for disposal of old cars, computers as an existing me mechanism may, that may be helpful to be adopted for the woodway sale. Yeah, with municipalities and even the state, we've always got you know surplus properties, however they refer to it. Um, and that may be a way to transfer those from the city to private or other persons. I do have one comment I'd like to make on this, this subject, Eric, is uh, you know cities can uh, put out bids for for, for materials, you know, if the city has logs they would need to get rid of and they don't want to show favoritism, you can always put it up for bid and let people bid on it. Uh, we got a question on what can I do with sweet gums. Uh, I learned from uh, a friend of mine up in Virginia that if you refer to your sweet gums as star oak, they become much more uh, marketable. Sometimes it's just marketing. <laughs> Other than that, I don't know what to do as we go. Well, you know, I'm a I'm a furniture guy, and we used to always use a lot of sweet gum in the furniture industry. It's it has its virtues. If you know how to dry it and how to use it, uh, furniture uh, is is uh, there's a place in the furniture industry for sweet gum. Kelly, we're coming up on. Uh, 10.55 here, and I'm just wondering, we've got to get to the, the final slides for quizzes for CFEs and CEUs. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Eric, and thank you very much, Harry. And um, I do hope that uh, in addition to 
Eric putting his email address um, in the chat window. Harry, if you have a moment and you're willing to share yours, please go ahead and put that in the chat window now. At this point, I want to remind everyone that this is the first webinar in a series that are being brought to you by the North Carolina Forest Service Urban and Community Forestry Program. And if you would like to know about the remainder uh, webinars that are coming up, the slide you see has the website where you can go and see a list of upcoming webinars that are part of this series called Planning in the Face of Change. And we plan to have one webinar a month through the month of May this year. If you are participating in any of the forestry um, webinar portal webinars, you will automatically be getting an email reminder of each one as they're coming up. But you can also visit this website at any time and um, see the dates and times and speakers that we have planned. So we hope to see you at a future uh, one of these webinars. Now, for those that are planning to receive ISA Arborist credits or CFE Continuing Forestry Education credits from Society of American Foresters, we have some instructions for you. If you're not interested in either of those kinds of credits, the webinar uh, participation for you today is finished, and we thank you for being here. But for those who want those credits, please stand by uh, while we give you the URL that you need to use to complete the satisfaction survey which leads you to the quiz. And you need to take and pass the quiz following the instructions that come up on your screen in order to qualify for either the ISA or the CFE credits. So now I want to direct your attention to the chat window where I'm going to uh, paste in a very long URL which should work clickable directly from your screen that will uh, send you into that process for completing the satisfaction survey and taking and passing the quiz. And I'm going to also um, push, as it were, your webinar to that same URL automatically at this time so uh, your screen should come up uh, with that process as well. So you're, you'll be redirected automatically, or you can click that link to get to that survey.